great to see that so many sticks around for this last and closing keynote for day one. And uh, to do that, we have a story from one of the most contemporary expressions of autonomy and freedom. Organizations have historically been built for control, repetition, and scale. Stability and predictability have been the pillars of growth in classical thinking. These design criteria, they're currently undergoing a dramatic change in a world where the way we work has no one ideal structure. Richard and Natalia, they share a desire to work in a less hierarchical model and in a more collaborative way and works on finding solutions for the recurring challenges that humans encounter every day. Tonight, we can say tonight now, right? No. Uh, tonight they will share with us some examples of decentralized organizations through their work with companies like The Hum and Lumio. Please give them a warm, warm welcome. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, no expectations, though. Please uh, reduce your expectations right now. Uh, the future <laughs> of organizing. Yeah, so I'm Natty. Uh, you can call me Natty. It's a shorter one. This one is uh, Rich, obviously. And uh, we're going to share with you a little bit of our story uh, from working in the Inspiral Network and the Lumio Cooperative and what we now call the HUM. So we're going to guide you through these things. And mainly what we want is to share with you what are the lessons that we learned after around a decade of working, uh, being embedded in decentralized organizations. And I get a bit nervous on stage, so forgive me as I uh, relax into it. I um, have a previous life as an audio engineer, so I'm really glad to see you taking the disturbance off the microphone. My name's Richard, thank you. Um, we're gonna try and condense uh, a decade of experience in decentralized organizing into like half an hour so that we've got time for some questions and answers. Nati and I have been traveling around a lot lately and um, everywhere we go there's this, this buzzword, the future of work, it keeps coming up. And as we were getting ourselves uh, organized and prepared for this talk, we thought, what is this future of work? What are people talking about? What, are people, what image does, does someone have in mind when they say that at our future of work? So we did the logical thing and did some research, went on Google, went on you know, TED Talks and so on, <laughs> start searching future of work. And what you see looks mostly something like this. It might be more accurate to call it the future of not work. It seems to be mostly about automation, about how robots are going to take our jobs and we're going to be unemployed. And what are we going to do when you know all these uh, new technologies replace our jobs? What are we going to do with all these people? Well, um, we're going to drop them into a virtual reality universe, and by some paradox, they're going to be you know plugged in 24/7, but deeply disconnected and isolated from each other and, and it's like these are the kind of themes that we're picking up as we go looking into the future of work that, that seems to be uh, in, in the flavor at the moment. And what I hear, and we saw it again this morning in Evans, one of Evans' polls, one of the biggest words you see is fear. You know, there's this like, deep anxiety and uncertainty about an unpredictable future. So, yeah. We didn't come to tell you about the negative stuff, so we're actually, what we want to share with you is a different story, okay? <laughs> so for us, our vision of what the future of work could be like looks a little bit like this, and it's probably quite similar to um, what a lot of you think about. So for us, the organization of the future of work are purpose-driven, right? So profit is not the main goal, but contributing to society and to other individuals, it, it is. They're decentralized. They're networks of uh, autonomous and interdependent groups where no one is in charge, but everyone can take on acts of leadership in different areas. The decision-making is shared. So everyone in this network can make the decisions about the important 
things that are happening all together. Their structure is co-created, so they're not only creating a structure that suits them, but they also the people working in it can improve it and change it as their needs in the organization change. Um, and um, it's an environment where experimentation and iteration is where mark marks progress. And it's not only safe to fail, but it's also encouraged as a very important part of the learning process. In these organizations, the culture is of high trust among the individuals. And I lost the clicker. Here we go. And there's a lot of care and mutual support among the people that work there to um, help each other to develop into who they want to be and the kind of work they want to have. Well, we are not here just to talk about an imaginary future. It's not really how we work because this is not just a future state, it's our present state in Inspiral. Um, maybe it's because New Zealand is 12 hours ahead of Europe. We've got this like early access to what the future might be like. Um, these are some of my closest friends, um, colleagues, peers, co-owners of the Inspiral Network in a board meeting. Yes, somebody is wearing a banana suit. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try and explain in very, uh, the, the smallest amount about what Inspiral is and skip ahead to the lessons. Um, you can think of Inspiral as a network of purpose-driven companies and freelancers kind of swarming around these companies. We have a, uh, pretty much all of us have a profound allergy to corporate hierarchies, so we're all um, deeply invested in experimenting with different orga organizational forms. So it's like a, a, a radical laboratory for prototyping different ways of organizing, like how can we share money, information, power, control, uh, as widely as possible in a company. The other thing we have in common is that we want to do meaningful work. We say we're working on stuff that matters. And that stuff that matters is intentionally vague. It leaves a lot of space uh, for what matters to you. So uh, some of those people I showed you on the previous slide, some of them are working on adult education, some of them are working on mental health, uh, food systems, environmental systems. Like, there's lots of different um, fo focal points of what, what can matter. What matters to me, the, the focal point that I have is about this decentralized organization thing. This, how, can, how can we, like I really, love my autonomy and my agency and my freedom. Um, I resonated a lot this morning with the anarchism talk. Like I really want to have my freedom, but I also want to do something purposeful and impactful and, and coordinate with other people. So the, my guiding question is like, how do you strike that balance between freedom and, and coordination? And so I started down that track following that question by uh, launching a company with a, with a bunch of people that's called Lumio. So that's one of the many companies in the Inspiral Network. And Lumio is a software platform. It's pretty straightforward. It's a discussion forum. Uh, the only difference with our discussion forum is that there are a bunch of facilitation features that support you to have a productive deliberation that comes to a conclusion. You can poll and put up proposals and vote and so on. At the same time as we've got the software, though, the, uh, my interest has been on, the, on our actual team. So there's about 10 of us. And it's been an opportunity to prototype new ways of working together and, and test out our theories and practice and see what works. So a really important characteristic of, of the Lumio team is that the workers own the company. There, there isn't some external body. And we, we manage together. It's a self-managed enterprise and it's constitutionally, our social impact is guaranteed ahead of our profit. We make a profit, but we're, we're in business to pursue a mission first. And the software is open source, so we, we think that we are we're not owners in the private sense, but more in a stewardship sense. We're looking after something that is a, a public resource. About, yeah, we've been working on this for, you know, about five years, and it's, and it's had some degree of success. There's a few thousands of groups around the world that, that use Lumio to make their collaboration more efficient. Uh, but somewhere early last year, I started to get intrigued about, like, I have this vision for a world full of decentralized organizations. And software like Lumio and other kinds of software can help with that, but I really started to wonder, like, what else, besides software, what else do groups struggle with when they try and, and step into a collaborative, decentralized mode? Yeah, so 
Last year, Rich and I, <coughs> we started this thing that we call the HUM. Um, what we do is we provide practical guidance for decentralized organizations, as our tagline tells you. Uh, and what we did was travel around the world <coughs> into all these little dots that you see there, not yet in Africa, but coming soon. And we met with a lot of different groups that, like us, were trying to organize in a different way, right? Um, some of them call it decentralized or flat or non-hierarchical, but the whole thing is about collaboration. So we met people like um, the city council in um, Seoul, and then we worked also with some corporates in New York and some tech startups in Berlin. But we also work with people like an occupied apartment building in Barcelona and a small community group in Buenos Aires working in slums to make the lives of the people that live there a little bit better. So, as you can imagine, all those groups, actually, they have very different words to describe who they are and what they do. But when it comes to working together, they have very similar aspirations on how they want their work and environment to be like. So, out of our own experience on our organizations and what we picked up on the road, we started developing this thing that we call Patterns for Decentralized Organizing. And basically, is um, what we find is that a lot of us, we face similar challenges when we're trying to do something a little bit different, a little bit out of the norm. And so we can't really go onto a lot of detail on this today because we normally run this on a full day or two day workshop. But we do want to share with you some of the key insights that we have um, learned on the way. I have my cheat sheets. There we go. So we'll start with the cultural side and I'll share with you some of that and then Rich will share with you some of the parts from the structure. So. If you are like me, um, you probably grew up in very hierarchical systems. So since I was a little girl and I was at home and then I went to school and then I, I got a job and even to the country, there was always someone telling others what to do, right? So um, what happens is that when we try to collaborate, we try to build a different way of being together, we bring all these hierarchical expectations and behaviors that we learned along the way. So the first thing to do is actually unlearn some of those patterns and learn new ones. And um, of course, this is not easy, but it's not impossible either. It just takes a little bit of time and patience. So, in not many schools, they actually teach us how to collaborate, right? Let alone, they actually teach us about the basis for collaboration. That is um, what research has found to be emotional intelligence. And what is this emotional intelligence thing? It's basically skills like self-awareness, emotional self-regulation, empathy, reading social environments, good communication skills, being able to communicate with others in an open, clear, and honest way, giving feedback, asking for help, and, and so on. So those are the kind of skills that are actually very important when you're trying to build positive relationships, right? So if they don't teach us these skills at school, how do we learn them? Well, one thing is, of course, you can go to training workshops and learn from the experts. But psychology also tells us that the way that we learn as humans is by picking up behaviors from each other. We're constantly modeling and mimicking behaviors unconsciously. It happens all the time, right? You came here, you saw that there were people sitting down and some people up here, and you knew that you had to sit down and listen to others. That's a behavior that you picked up. So if we learn all these things unconsciously, Imagine what much more, how much more efficient we can actually be at learning different skills and the kind of skills that are necessary if we are conscious about the kind of culture and behaviors that we want in our teams. And of course, relationships are not just about learning skills from each other. They're about creating bonds and getting to know each other, who we are. So, 
and this, like for me, knowing who you are beyond your job title, what moves you and why, what's your story, where you came from, what is important to you, but also what happens when you're stressed and when you're scared. Because if we are going to build a decentralized organization and share the business, I want to be able to trust you. Imagine having a baby with someone. Right? You want to be able to know them and trust them very well, at least until the baby is like 18 and they can <laughs> deal for themselves. So, there we go. So, um, you probably read that big study that they did at Google, the project Aristotle, and what they found out was that psychological safety was the number one factor of highly productive, thriving teams. So, how do you create a psychologically safe environment? Well, all the things that I mentioned before, emotional intelligence, building relationships of trust, is kind of like the base. But also, if you already have some of those things, what you could do to keep on building that psychological safety environment is actually making sure that people feel safe to come as they are, to be themselves at work. Not only that, but also that they feel heard that they can bring new ideas into the table, even if they don't think they're the best ones, and they'll be fine. And most importantly, that they um, are safe to disagree, that they can actually stand up in the group to what they don't think is okay, and that sense of belonging to the group is not gonna be threatened. So, I'm gonna share with you some of the uh, practical things that we do in a little bit, but, so, Basically, what I'm trying to say is that if you do build a culture with high trust, where people feel cared for and safe, you actually are building a very strong foundation that a group that is trying to collaborate can actually deal with all the other challenges that are all the structural parts and all the conflict that you're going to find along the way much easily. And that's very good, but... Let's talk a little bit about power. So, basically in every group of humans, there's a lot of different power dynamics at play, right? We know that. But what happens is that in the kind of um, organizations that we work with, in decentralized organizations, people don't really like to talk about power. So, I'm gonna talk to you about three different kinds of power that play in groups, just so we can get comfortable with it. So, the first kind of power is the coercive type, right? It's what is called power over. It's the power that someone has to tell someone else what to do, and if they don't do it, there'll be negative consequences for them. And that's the kind of power that we want to fight against. But by fighting against that one, and not wanting to even talk about it, we forget to actually see the other kinds of power that could be quite positive. And some of those are, ooh, I forgot to click. So there's this other one called power with, or what is called as well social capital. And that's the level of influence that my voice has in a room. It can be built by, um, maybe I'm the elder in the group, maybe I've been here the longest, and I have a lot of the connections, and I have a lot of the context. But maybe it's also built by um, reputation. I took on a lot of tasks, I deliver, uh, you know that you can trust me, that I'm accountable, right? And then there's the other kind of power, that is the power that comes from within, is what we call empowerment. It's the sense that I matter, that um, I believe in myself, that I can do what I want with my life and it's going to be fine, knowing that I have a choice. And what happens with these kind of dynamics is that those last two that I mentioned, they could be quite positive if they're actually acknowledged and talked about. So, I'm going to share with you some of the practical stuff. And the first thing is about talking about power. We, in our groups, we don't only talk about power, like how's the power going, like what's the weather like outside? We just actually bring those dynamics into the table, we look at them and we decide together what we want to do with it. And one of the things that we do is we rotate the influential roles. So, roles that attract a lot more social capital we share them around the team uh, regularly. 
Sometimes every six months, sometimes every year, we change around the people that are in those roles so they can also earn a little bit of that capital. Sometimes we even have two or three people in the role. And um, the idea with that is they're not only earning social capital, but we're also building resilience because everyone has a turn and they know the pieces of the puzzle that we all need to work together well. Another thing for us is that care is part of the job. As I mentioned before, building relationships of trust and care is very important for us. And the way that we care about each other is with this thing that we call stewardship. So stewardship is basically a peer support uh, system that we have developed. But instead of going um, in like two ways, like a body system, it goes one way. So I care for Richard, Richard will care for you, you will care for her, and that so on, so on, so on, until someone is taking care of me. So we are all constantly taking care of someone and being cared by someone else. So it's not just one person in the group that holds all this tension about making sure that everyone is okay. That's part of the job that we are doing. And a new thing that we are testing is this thing that we call care pods. We're testing this at Inspiral right now. And the idea is that we're going to do this stewardship system, but instead of one on one, it's going to be small groups of four to six people. And the idea is that by generating those kind of groups, smaller groups inside the network, for the people that are not already part of a group like us, that we have Lumia, will create those deep relationships of trust and support that they can count on. And this is a really good way to model behavior to each other and to pass on a little bit of this emotional intelligence. Because let's say I was not very good at caring. That's not true, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and he's really good. And um, so he's my steward and he's taking care of me. And then by that, I'm learning how to do it. I'm picking up from him, how do you take care of someone? And then I can pass on that to someone else in the team and they can learn. So the emotional intelligence of the team keeps on growing. And the last thing is retreats. Every six to 12 months, we go on retreat. And we don't go on retreat to work. We, don't, we barely have uh, talks about what's going on, uh, what's the strategy like, what we're going to do the next five months. We basically spend time bonding again. We go together like three, four days outside the city in nature. It's very easy to do that in New Zealand. And we spend time just bonding again, like remembering who you are. Maybe you live on the other side of the planet and I don't see you more than, you know, like this part of you on a video call. So when we are together there, we remember again, why is that we are doing this together, right? And we get to share a little bit of the experiences that we have. So we call, we call it the heartbeat because for us, that's the moment, you know, like, We've been working and we got a little bit disengaged and I haven't seen you in six months, so the trust just keeps on going down. And when we get together, it's like, yay, we're together again and this is awesome, we love each other, awesome. And then we have that energy to keep on going for the rest of the year. So that's a little bit about the culture. We can talk about more on the q and I'm glad you've got the culture side. That to me is the hard, most difficult stuff to get, right? And once that is sorted, then the rest is its easy. It kind of solves itself. It's like, oh, we've got a problem. We need to solve it. If you've got an open communication foundation, it seems like the structural changes just come really easily. I'll just share a, a couple of the, the structural pieces that have been breakthroughs for us, and, and those breakthroughs have um, been shared into other groups. So uh, Lumio actually came out of... Uh, Nati and I had an experience in the, in the Occupy movement, and for me, that was my first, um, my first taste of collective decision-making. It was my first time sitting in a circle and doing consensus. And I was super inspired by it, and, and it changed my life in a way that made me very attached to this idea that consensus is the, is the right tool for every job. And it's really common we encounter an uh, oversimplification where... I was certainly carrying this oversimplification around, which is like you can either have a top-down model where there's a dictator calling the shots, or you can have a bottom-up model where you have to get consensus all the time. And I certainly, in our organization, I didn't want to have the dictatorship, so we kept falling more and more back into consensus all the time. And while consensus is pretty great for bonding and forming a shared identity and learning about each other and doing that shared understanding thing, 
it's not very efficient for doing tactical decisions. So over the years, we've loosened up a little bit. I've loosened up a bit and found some space between those, those two ends of the, of the uh, polarity. I'm, I'm going to touch on two of them quickly. Uh, some of them have already come up today, so that's uh, refreshing to hear. This book, Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Lailu, has been touched quite a few times. So if you haven't read it, I would say the conference is trying to tell you to read it. Um, <laughs> Evan gave some disclaimers for it too, so I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I really treasure about this book is that it gave a name to the advice process, which is something you might recognize informally, but to have a name for it and say, no, this is actually the process. This is what we're doing. Uh, can be really helpful. So the essence of the advice process is I understand it. Anyone can take any decision if they're willing to take responsibility for the outcome and they first seek the advice of anyone who's going to be affected and anyone with expertise. So the key word there is listen. Like seek advice and listen to it. It's not negotiate, come to agreement, water it down, get to a consensus. It's just you listen you check in, and then you make the call that you think is right. There's a festival in uh, Denmark called the Borderland. They have currently, I think, 800 and something people on their version of Lumio running that entire week-long festival, which is all participant created with thousands of people using the advice process. That's the only, only decision-making method they use. It's like a super efficient way of involving people without getting stuck forever in this, like, can we all agree? Another method it was mentioned earlier today, consent. So if I oversimplify a little, if you think of consensus as everyone agrees or at least everyone can agree that we've, we've come to the best outcome we can get to with the time that we have, consent is not so far. It's not about everyone getting to agreement. It's no one holds an objection anymore. There's quite a big space between that. Consensus, uh, can we all agree that this is the best thing that we could possibly think of doing right now? Consent. Is this good enough? Can we move? Can we keep moving? And it, it was, it's, to my knowledge, uh, started in the sociocracy world and then passed over to holacracy, and now it's picking up steam. I heard it three times today, so people are hearing about this, this phrase, good enough for now, safe enough to try. The emphasis is on movement. Like, let's do something and learn and see what happens, rather than spending all of this time like trying to get an agreement about some imaginary future. So yeah, now, now um, I've loosened up my identity somewhat, not so fixated on consensus being the tool for every job, and comfortable with the idea that actually there are many different kinds of decisions. You know, there's, there's a decision about what words we put on our website, and there's a decision about who should we share the company with. And it doesn't make sense to use the same tool for those two very completely different jobs. Speaking of decisions, so again, it was mentioned this morning about uh, working in an asynchronous way. And that's a, uh, asynchronous communication has some very unique characteristics that have some pros and cons. And it really pays to be able to understand the pros and cons of real time, so what we're doing right now is real time, versus asynchronous where you participate in your own time. The proposition with Lumio, I mean, let's just cast our minds back to the dawn of humanity Ever since we had humans trying to work together, if you want to make an important decision with a group of people, you do it in a meeting. That's always been the way that we do it. You do it in a meeting. If it's important, you get everyone face to face. And in the last decade or two, we've augmented those meetings with video conferencing. So you have, it's still a real time meeting, but you can distribute it across multiple locations. The proposition with Lumio is that you can do these important decisions, you can include people without having to get them to all pay attention at the same time. And obviously we've been using this in our own organization to test how that works. And it's not something that you can just flick the light on and say, oh, okay, now we're going to shift all of our decision making out of meetings into an asynchronous environment where people can participate when they want. But certainly we've, we've developed a capacity to understand, you know, meetings are really good when there's, if you need to be able to read body language and have that emotional uh, complexity, do, do those kind of conversations in a meeting. But when it's, when it's a, yeah, going through last week's meeting minutes, line by line, and agreeing, can we all agree that this is an accurate record of last week's meeting? It's just not a good use of your meeting time. So those kind of decisions can be shunted off onto Lumio. 
and not just simple decisions like that, really important strategic decisions like our annual plan, we'll have a meeting about it, but the final decision will happen on Lumia because it means people can participate in their own time and it's a transparent, accessible, uh, uh, it's, it's stored in our organizational memory because the arguments are being made in that text format. Many of you here I've, I've picked up about, uh, seems like pretty much everyone here is familiar with Agile Scrum methodology. And uh, we, we always finish on this point about retrospectives being the, the, the engine of collective intelligence. In the Agile world, it's really, um, people are familiar with retrospectives for improving products. We are driving the whole organizational improvement program through the retrospective progress process. So it's a process of stop, look back, what was good, what was bad, what are we going to do differently? In the environment where people have these, um, the ability to express themselves openly, it's a very rapid way to uh, change the things that are not work working and learn quickly. In fact, if you look at our the details of like what meetings we have and what time and who's in what meetings, we spend five to ten times more energy in learning about the recent past than we do about trying to predict an unpredictable future. Like, we don't, say at Lumio or at Inspiral, we don't have a strategy. We have not agreed what the strategy is. We have strategic conversations. We talk about what are some different things that could happen in the future, but we don't try and put all this energy into agreeing on something that we know we cannot possibly predict. We put the energy instead into looking back on the recent past and saying, what did we learn from that and how are we going to do differently next time? There's a really lovely consulting org in um, New York that do that support decentralized organizations called The Ready. And they have this, this phrase, which I love, continuous participatory change. And that, that's, my, that's my future of work. When, when I look into the future, I see continuous change. That seems like uh, exhilarating change. That just seems to be taken for granted. But I think the fear aspect, the, the anxiety and the uncertainty aspect of that uh, is because it's missing the participation. So if things are always changing and I'm being disoriented all the time, uh, it's going to be really uncomfortable. But if I can participate in adapting, as the, if I can roll with the punches, you know, if I can actually have some buoyancy, then it's, it's no longer like, oh, a terrifying change is being inflicted on me again. It's actually a fun process of adapting to your conditions. What I'm trying to get at, the, the underlying thread here, is that the organizational structure, I think, for a responsive, agile, adaptive organization needs to be unique. You can't, I don't think you can copy one organizational structure like a, blu a blueprint. To, to read, like We've heard some pretty cool blueprints and I've learned a bunch of stuff from what people have been saying today. But I don't think we can take any, like I don't think I can take that blueprint from IBM and then go and try and run it in Inspiral. If these organizations are always changing, like why would your model this week make sense to me next week? Like it doesn't, doesn't work that way. But at the same time, I don't think we have to start from scratch either. And, and actually it, with us in, in Inspiral, we are a little bit prone to starting from scratch all the time. Um, the idea with these patterns is that maybe we can have some modules or some, some key questions or provocations that we can use to um, accelerate our learning process, to, to find that sweet spot between copying from a blueprint and reinventing everything from scratch every time. So one last thing I want to share with you is for me, this is the most important question that you could be asking together in your groups. How do we want to be together? Ask that question, sit with that question, think about that question and let the answers to those questions guide you into building the kind of culture and relationships that are going to take you into the future of work that you and your team want. That's all for us. Um, I know it's very condensed, so we are open for questions and we're going to be around. And if you are in other parts of Europe, we're going to be running full day training workshops on these that are quite participatory where you can get to experience stuff. So if you go to theham.org slash events, um, you'll see all the, all the dates. Great, thank you so much. And we will close off with some feedback and questions. Floor is open.
so I'm not sure how to f pose this question. So you've got a continuum where you've got consensus, consent, and then dictatorship on one side where somebody else is telling you. But in situations where you've got uh, organizations that aren't making decisions but there's action, or in other situations you've got organizations that it's, um, it's the inertia of not making decisions, it's just holding them in one spot. Where does Lumio fit in that picture or how, I guess it's a challenging question in that they're not ready for something like that, but at the same time it's a common situation in lots of large complex organizations. Mm -hmm. I mean this is one of the motivations for doing the hum as a person-to-person -person consulting thing alongside the software thing. It's like Lumio we've seen is really effective for groups who already know how to collaborate. Uh, and it doesn't give you that much guidance about to, to, to break you through. And so this is, it's kind of like we're doing our user research and, and design thinking now, maybe five years late. Um, and, and I should say most of the groups that we're working with, like the ones that we're really intimately involved with, are operating at a reasonably small scale and in the, in the sort of up to hundreds of people. And w the, the intention for us to be participating in conferences like this is if we're a laboratory for new organizational forms, like how do we share our results in a way that is relevant to people that have to deal with legacy systems and, and institutional inertia and so on. And the best that we know from our experience so far is you start small. You know, you find a little tiny bubble of autonomy with maybe one team or one um, cross-functional project and start prototyping new behaviors and, and roles and structures within that and, and convince people by attraction, you know, not by telling them if you only did this you'd be more effective. But to establish a new working culture within just a small team and people start to look over the corner and say, "What? I want what they're having. And in terms of decision making, it applies as well because the idea is that you start, maybe, if, maybe you say, great, that sounds great, I want to try Lumia to collaborate, maybe we can start doing that and, and in that way we'll learn a different way of making decisions together or I involve more people. But maybe you can start with one kind of decision that you're going to do online and give it a try and get people to get used to this new way of doing it and then you can start including more things. First of all, first of all, bravo, bravo. Lovely work, thank you. <laughs> um, so let me throw a couple hashtags in here. How about hashtag me too? Uh, let's be real, what's going on politically right now, right? And what have you found You're in the hum and in other places? What about the role of women? What about the role of uh, diverse cultures, backgrounds, et cetera, in creating these safe cultures and emotionally intelligent spaces and what are some of the obstacles when we really dig in and work in diverse teams? Ooh, you just press the right <laughs> button for Richard to go on for another hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's great. So um, I'll give you the floor because you love talking, mm, but I'll pitch in later. Mm, um, yeah, talk to me afterwards Sorry, about politics. Gender, eh? I, I mean, uh, I, but this, the short version, um, when I have this question, what are the obstacles to more decentralized organization? I can't help but come to the conclusion that the biggest obstacle is patriarchy. That the kinds of behaviors and skills that we need to have effective power sharing, those attributes are coded feminine and in a patriarchy feminine behaviors are less valuable. So the more you're willing to uh, speak from a position of authority and dominate, the more you're, you're going to go up the pay scale. And until we change our attitudes about what kind of behaviors are valuable, uh, we're going to be pushing an uphill battle. That's the short version. The long version we can have over a beer about like all the awesome political movements all over the world that are using Lumia. Hi, thanks for a very inspiring talk. Um, when trying to change the culture and um, ways of working of a company that starts from a very traditional hierarchical role, mm -hmm. would you have a framework or a way to decide what's to, be, to begin with between cultural aspects and structural aspects? Because these two things are interdependent. Mm -hmm. Do you have guidelines on what's easier to start with or do these things have to be made up front? Yeah, I'll say um, there's a lot in that. <laughs> Transformation is a big topic. Um, so I'll say, as we named before, start small. Start with a team that are kind of ready to get going into that. And 
there's this phrase that I really like that I read somewhere online and I can't remember, but it says, people don't resist change, they resist change done to them. So I think the idea is engage the people. Do we want to collaborate? Do we want to have a decentralized team? Is that something that we want here? Do we want to practice this, us in our 10 people team? Great, then let's go for it. And then getting the engagement of everyone in that team to try it, to start developing, to experiment, to learn new things. And what we have seen is that in big organizations, when you have little pods that are starting to collaborate, and they get a different vibe going and a different culture and people are like, yeah, it's Monday, I'm going to work. And the others in the organization are like, oh, wait a minute, that team over there, they seem to be doing something right. Like, what is it? I want it as well. So that's a really good place to start. Usually we, the structure we implement first is a retrospective and yes. that is the gateway to the culture because what happens is people say, you ask them what's not working so well and because they're so pent up with all the things that are not working so well, you get straight to the heart of the matter. Usually there's some tears and it takes, you know, a few days to recover from, but that gives you the material to then work from. Only on the first retrospective, then you don't cry anymore. Uh, but also, like, if you are, like, if by then you have a culture that had a manager and the manager actually wants to step out and build something different, that, that movement takes time. The stepping out so others can step in doesn't happen instantly. And what we've seen a lot of the time is that managers are like, great, I'm out of here, you deal with it. And then people make mistakes and things don't go right and they're like, well, I knew it. This doesn't work, I need to step in again and I'm gonna tell everyone what to do. So that movement is I step out and give you a little bit of space and encouragement, right? that empowerment thing, that's part of it. It's like, come on, you can do it. Do you want to facilitate the meeting this time? Because I've been doing it for years. Do you want to do it? You'll do a great job. Or do you want to actually do, take the leadership on that project that we're doing? Why not? So it's those acts of actually giving space to someone to build, build their power into those different positions, but also the patience to let them learn and knowing that they're not going to do it great, they're not going to do it like you do it, but they're eventually going to learn a way of doing it that is theirs. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. This might be more of a practical question, but I was wondering how you actually measure outcomes or value with your clients. Do you measure team productivity, uh, happiness, psychological safety? Like, can you, can you quantify those things? Can we quantify those things? In, um, Good question. In, in the Lumio we team, we uh, have a process where we set objectives every, every 90 days. We usually have three measurable targets that we're going for, you know, and it's like, okay, we've got all these autonomous units going in all different directions, but what can we all agree that we're, do we have in common? And I remember uh, one of those, you know, KPIs or whatever, was um, <laughs> measurably improve the vibe of the team. <laughs> and that, that, um, begs the question, like, how do you measure the vibe? And so we, uh, that's actually when we invented, I think that was when we invented the Well Working yeah. Group. So the Well Working Group is the working group that makes sure that we're working well. And they devise systems for checking in on the team health and the safety and, and um, systems for red flags, like how do you let people know when things are not working? Like if you don't have a boss, where are you gonna take your, your big concern that you feel like awkward about sharing? So we've done, we've done some interesting measurement stuff internally within Lumio. Um, but the work that we've been doing with organizations, we haven't, we haven't matured yet, I think, to the stage, apart from people saying very nice testimonials afterwards, <laughs> that kind of self-reporting, like, we had a great time, we were so inspired, we learned so much, like, we haven't, we haven't tracked yet to, to see the, the improvements. And I think it's a really, um, we need to do that. I mean, not us, the HUM needs to do that, but as advocates of decentralized self-management sort of systems, we need to prove that the resilience and the engagement and the productivity goes up. Um, one thing that I noticed over the course of the day, there's this focus in this room on a customer-centric organization. And what we've taken within our work has very much been a worker-centric organization, saying like, if you're gonna spend most of your life here, like, let's make it a really great experience. And um, we've just focused on like, getting everyone feeling really good. <laughs> and there's more work to do yet to quantify those sorts of things and, and, and sharpen up the focus on the, on the market end and that sort of thing. 
I think that's a great way to, uh, to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Nati and Rich. Thank you all.